Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are very fortunate this evening. We couldn't have chosen two more dedicated and qualified persons to talk on this subject that hasn't received the amount of attention and consideration that it deserves. The topic, as you know, is violence, the outdated centerpiece of domestic and foreign policy. Our first speaker is Kathy Peters. She has worn several hats in a career that includes a radio national journalist, former Greens Council on Miracle Council, and, this, and a significant member of the CJPP that stands for the Council for Justice and Peace in Palestine. She recently lived in Ramallah on the West Bank, where among other things she made radio programs about the uses of archaeology and competing narratives about Israel-Palestine and life in East Jerusalem. And wait for this, Jerusalem, divine crime. Mm -hmm. Divine crime. Seen, of course. Okay, anyway. Besides her experience in media and communications, Kathy has a strong commitment to human rights and sustainable humanitarian work. Hello everyone. Look, I'd like to start by um, reading the acknowledgement of country that's actually used at Magdal Council, because I think it's pretty apt for tonight's um, discussion. Uh, we meet on the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and we acknowledge the terrible wrongs committed against the Aboriginal peoples of this country and their care of the land over many generations. We celebrate their ongoing survival and achievements in today's society. I'd also like to acknowledge that today we remember the Habakusha from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and mourn with them for the 225,000-odd souls who died as a result of the unparalleled violence that was visited upon the civilian populations 70 years ago. I'm going to focus on the domestic aspects of violence in our community. Stuart's going to look at the broader picture of violence in our foreign policy. Um, but I thought I'd just focus in on probably a lot of things that we all know, but just try to draw them together in, in terms of the way they are an expression of the violence within our society, and particularly within our domestic policies. Um, on Tuesday this week, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that a Reclaim Australia supporter was charged with threatening to slit the throat of a prominent lawyer. As you might have suspected, this uh, lawyer was a Muslim, and she was a campaigner against Islamophobia. Marion Bezade, or Bezade has been subject to shocking online abuse and threats from a number of Australians, including the 37-year-old mother of two who was charged. Apparently this uh, woman was going to find her and hunt her down and slit her throat. She's a member of the Reclaim Australia movement that's flourished in recent times as a direct result, I think, of the Abbott government's scapegoating, scapegoating of Islam and refugees for political ends. <coughs> Despite all evidence to the contrary, this government is fuel, fueling an anti-terror fear campaign that's attempting to locate terrorism in the heart of our communities, dog whistling our Muslim community and feeding the latent racism in this country. As we've also seen in recent weeks, rugby union crowds can effortlessly become swept up into ugly racist chanting. To me, the problem we face as Australians is that we're heirs of a racist settler colonialist empire that has yet to be really civilised. We're yet to find compassion and pride in acting ethically and fairly. White Australia of the 50s and 60s was born of the racist settler violence of the 19th century. And to me, this heritage is there looming large today as the two major political parties collaborate to impose a series of laws that curtail our civil liberties, demonise asylum seekers, and continue to, do, to deny justice to the first peoples of this country. Our domestic policies are more aggressive and repressive than most of us have ever experienced. And ironically, they don't deal with the endemic violence that's escalating in our community. Violence towards Indigenous people, women and Muslims and the horrible violence towards children that we now know has been at the core of civilised Western religious society for generations. So, while the Abbott government spins its terrorist fear narrative over and over again, which actually belies belief, given our enormously safe country, 
we don't speak of the terror that's here in our society, in our institutions, and in our laws that operate within states that operate with state-state-sanctioned violence against the most vulnerable in our community. We've seen draconian anti-terror legislation that will offer the police, the ADF, and the ACO even wider powers. It will now criminalise reporting from our horrific detention centres, setting the stage for journalists and whistleblowers to be jailed for information that is rightly in the public interest. These laws will also allow, a will also allow ASIO agents to use force in interviews, although of course we're assured that this won't mean torture. The Australian Border Force Act, which was passed recently with bipartisan support, is another law that seeks to silence us. Professionals working in immigration detention centres are now prevented from raising concerns about detention centre conditions and the physical and psychological treatment of asylum seekers because they risk two years in jail. So if we witness child abuse in Australia, we're legally bound to report it to child protection authorities. But if we witness child abuse in detention centres, we can go to prison for attempting to advocate for them effectively. As a community, we've allowed both the Coalition and the ALP to enforce more draconian laws around the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, which to me have a thinly veiled racist subtext going right back to white Australia and to the narratives and policies that have been part of Australian political life since the 1950s, since the 1850s, when you know. Amidst all this talk of terrorism, we as a community have been blind to the real domestic terrorism of violence towards women, Aboriginals, refugees, and primarily Muslim refugees. The courageous Rosie Batty brought this to our attention when she spoke at the National Press Club last year. She was talking about domestic violence. Wherever there is the slightest threat of terrorism, it's amazing how funding can be found to combat that where there seemingly was no funding before. But how about we start by calling family violence terrorism and then maybe we will start to see an investment of funding applied to there where it needs to be. It's estimated that two Australian women are killed by domestic violence each week. And so far this year, 55 women have been killed in crimes related to domestic violence. You can read about each of these murders and you can see the names and ages of the victims on the Destroy the Joints Facebook page titled Counting Dead Women. So in approximately 30 weeks of this year, we've seen 55 deaths. As I said, that's almost two a week. And yet, this extreme violence towards women barely rates a mention, and does so only when it's so hideous and violent, as in the murder of Rosie Batty's son, Luke, that it gets oxygen. And most of that has been due to the amazing, strong and articulate persona of Rosie. We see women's support services and refuges cut with each successive budget of this government. Only yesterday I heard a report from the Royal Commission into Family Violence explaining how archaic is our justice system that treats victims with shocking indifference. Women who take legal action against perpetrators are often forced not only to appear in the same court as the perpetrator, but often forced to sit and wait in the same waiting room as the person that's abused them and attacked them for hours on end. The Victorian Police Association, in a submission to the Royal Commission into Family Violence, says calls for help are often put on hold because of chronic understaffing, while outdated reporting systems are leaving women and children exposed. They reported that the Victorian Police can't deal with the unprecedented, unprecedented number of family violence calls, and also that the justice system was not working to adequately punish, to adequately punish perpetrators with magistrates often too lenient towards abusers who have breached intervention orders. They commented, and this is the Victorian Police, the courts do not currently reflect the seriousness with which family violence is treated by police. They also have a backlog that's so long that domestic violent cases are left for months and months before any hearings. And then, as one judge put it, there's so little time, I have to deal with most cases in about five to 10 minutes. Sentencing advisory council figures show that only 17% of family violence intervention order breaches resulted in jail, and the majority, 22%, were dismissed, discharged, or released on good behaviour bonds. And that's in the years July 2011 to June 2014. So, moving on, I want to talk about the ongoing violence 
against people from our First Nation. The dispossession and racism suffered by generations of Indigenous Australians is criminal. I know many of you will know about the high rates of incarceration of Aboriginal people, but I'd like to just list a few statistics. As of June 2014, there were 9,264 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Australian prisons. This represents a 10% increase from the prior year and is in fact the highest number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners since 2004. There's been a corresponding 10% increase in the imprisonment rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, which is also the highest rate of increase since 2004. Three in four of these people, at 77%, had been in prison previously, compared to the percentage of non-Indigenous prisoners who had been in prison previously, and that, that was 52%. Um, the age standardised imprisonment rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons was 13 times greater than that for non-Indigenous people. 1,857 prisoners per 100,000 compared with 144 non-Indigenous prisoners per 100,000 of the population. According to a recent Amnesty International report, young Aboriginal people aged between 10 and 17 are 24 times more likely to be in detention than non-Indigenous youths. This report, which was titled A Brighter Tomorrow, states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people make up about 5% of the Australian population of 10 to 17 year olds, but comprise 59% of those in that age in detention. These statistics clearly show the level of dysfunction in our legal system and its recourse to arrest and imprisonment in lieu of positive, uh, positive approaches to chronic unemployment and chronic lack of access to education and skills training for Aboriginal youth. And from these shocking arrest and imprisonment rates, we come to deaths in custody. And here I'll include those deaths of refugees in detention as well. The New South Wales State Coroner's figures show that deaths in prison, police or immigration custody are at their highest level in a decade and a half. The latest figures from the New South Wales coroner. The rise is so steep that the backlog of deaths in custody inquests at the start of this year was the largest since 2000, when records of pending inquests began. 43 people died in police, prison or immigration custody in 2013. That was the largest number since 1997, when there were 56, 56 deaths in custody. This continues a five-year trend in which the average number of deaths has risen to 37 a year since 2009, up from 28 a year during the previous five years. But there's been a spike in the number of Indigenous deaths in custody in line, in custody, in line with almost doubling of the number of Aboriginal Australians being locked up. These findings come two decades after the landmark Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody which made 339 recommendations for reform, most of which have not been implemented. So we come back to our topic for tonight's session, violence, the outdated centrepiece of domestic and foreign policy. The increase in imprisonments and detention goes hand in hand with the use of privatised prisons. It turns out, and this was quite a surprise to me, that Australia has the highest proportion of prisoners in private corporate run prisons in the world. The percentage of prison, prisoners held in private prisons in Australia is 19%, compared to 17% in Scotland, 14% in England and Wales, and 11% in New Zealand. And this data dates from 2011, so it's quite probable that that percentage is higher now in 2015. In Australia, three private corporations, Serco, G4S and Geo Group, run private peak prisons in New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, Western Australia and South Australia. These three corporations are global giants. It's a billion dollar industry and they also run prisons in the US, UK, Europe, Israel and South Africa. G4S and Serco also run prisoner transport services, um, including transport services in Victoria and Western Australia. And we've heard about the tragedy that occurred in Western Australia a couple of years ago in the, um, prisoner transport. Mm. So, even though Australia has the highest proportion of prisoners in private corporate-run prisons in the world, our state governments are planning to radically expand the number of private prisons. 
despite serious questions also about the evidence on which private, um, prison privatisation is based. It was reported one circa contract for running Australia's detention centres was originally valued at 239 million, that's in two, 2009. Three amendments later, it was worth 1.6 billion. The contract for residential housing and immigration transit services grew from 44 million in 2009 to 194.4 million in 2013. And of course, those figures are much higher now, given the offshore detention. I know Stuart's going to talk more about the violence inherent in our treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, so I want to talk more about that now. But I would like to sum up by considering how is it that we in Australia have not managed to create a society in which violence is not one of the dominant modes of operation. How is it that my generation and the current generation haven't managed to impact on and change our governmental structures in ways that use compassion, equity and justice as fundamental to the way we do law, politics or education? How is it that in 2015 we can watch the racist spectacle of AFL fans booing an Indigenous man because he used his profile to call us out on racism and structural inequality? How did it become uncool to talk about rights, human rights, where did the human rights activists of the 60s go? Many of them, I think, went into bureaucracies where they became constrained and stayed silent and just did their jobs, leaving the activism to the next generation. Who are the lawyers that draft the inhumane legislation around asylum seekers? Well, who are the lawyers and judges that preside over courts where abused women and ch children struggle to find justice? Right now in Australia, we have a litany of wrongs. Most that resonate with the violence of colonisation and racism and sexism. We have a class of politicians who, in my mind, have no ethical framework whatsoever, and a compliant media and educated class that's become comfortably mute to the violence and suffering that's meted out on their behalf. My conviction is that we have to talk loudly. We have to talk loudly about ethics and compassion and the way we want to live, and we need to call out violence and particularly the violence that's so endemic in our society today. Thanks very much.